today's webinar. My name is Rebecca Nellens. I'm an associate with the Cedar Trees Institute and a fellow with the Center for Global Studies here at the University of Victoria, as well as an associate with the International Institute for Child Rights and Development. And I'm Keith Cherry. I'm an associate with the Cedar Tree Institute at the Center for Global Studies and a climate organizer with Rise and Resist. And uh, I'd just like to start our webinar today by acknowledging that uh, those of us joining from Victoria are joining from unceded territories of the Lekwungen speaking Songhees, Esquimalt, and the Sandwich Nations. And I want to acknowledge that that makes us uninvited guests on these lands, and that being an uninvited guest comes with obligations and responsibilities. And so I want to bear those in mind as we move forward, and I want to acknowledge as well that those of us uh, joining from around the world. Many of us are joining from the unceded territories of other nations to whom we also have responsibilities. And that even those of us who are not joining from unceded lands are still uh, joining from societies who are deeply shaped by the legacies of colonialism and, uh, and have a duty to carry that forward in our work as well. And we wanna make this acknowledgement, not just as something we do at the start of this webinar, but have this be something that we're talking about throughout the conversation today. Um, as we continue to learn from the multiple and diverse Indigenous communities and nations around the world about living in right relation with other humans um, and the land and the sustainable practices that they've been practicing for thousands of years. Uh, I'd also like to thank the Cedar Tree Institute and the Center for Global Studies here at the University of Victoria for organizing this webinar and uh, the Institute for Child uh, Rights and Development and also the Erasmus Plus Jean Monnet program of the European Union for its funding, uh, and the Center for Global Studies UCANET project, which hosts these webinars with the goal of bringing together experts from Europe and North America to discuss uh, current global issues. I also want to thank Beata Schmidtke uh, from the UCANET project who's organized uh, this webinar today. Thank you so much. The Cedar Trees Institute is a specialized center for research, teaching, and dialogue on global justice. It's hosted by the Center for Global Studies at UVic. CTI believes that global justice within Earth systems goes hand in hand with local justice within eco social systems. We practice community engaged research, co teaching, and the co production of knowledge with indigenous and non indigenous community members. The International Institute for Child Rights and Development, IICRD, is a hybrid organization, part NGO, part non governmental organization and part academic institution located in Canada, focused on social innovation and for children, for children and with children and youth, working in 45 countries around the world. It's also a member, a core member of the Intergenerational Climate Justice Coalition, a coalition of youth-focused NGOs, elders, and universities. Um, and the, I believe that there's quite a few folks from the ICJC, the IICRD, and CTI joining us today as participants. You'll notice that there's a chat box at the bottom of your screen. I encourage you all to introduce yourselves and keep the conversation going in that chat. Uh, but I'll ask that if you are not a presenter, if you're only participating today, to not turn on your webcam, just so that we can save the, the space on the screen for our presenters. So please, only our presenters should have their webcams on. And otherwise, you can use the chat box as a way to engage with us and uh, have input into the discussion. It's such an honor and pleasure to welcome you all to the webinar today. Over the last few months, millions of young people in thousands of cities around the world have taken to the streets in the name of climate justice. No summary that I could give would ever capture the diversity, momentum, or power of these movements. They're changing the agenda and the conversation at the local, national, and international levels. And young people are unequivocally clear. They're not stopping, they're not backing down, and they're not going away. This is not a movement that will be contained. While many didn't see this movement coming, it didn't appear out of nowhere. For years, youth around the world have been standing up in the name of climate and environmental justice, from the Yasunidos in Ecuador to the 21 youth plaintiffs in the US who are suing the American government for climate change since 2015, and we're gonna be hearing about that case today. Young people have never shied away from speaking out in the name of the earth or in the name of justice. Through this movement, however, Youth are successfully pointing out in the mainstream that the systems and institutions that we live by, from the economy to the systems of Western law to the nation state itself, should not be taken for granted as just how it is. 
These are human systems. Humans have created them, and humans can uncreate them. Young people around the world are demanding that we uncreate human systems that don't live in accordance with the Earth and shift to sustainable ways of living, something indigenous communities and nations around the world have done and continue to do for thousands of years. This is a movement to return to ourselves as citizens of the Earth and a movement to listen to and learn from young people everywhere, as well as indigenous wisdoms and traditional knowledge. It's not just an imagined future reality, but it's a way of being that already exists and persists all around us. Today, we will hear from a handful of the thousands of youth activists and organizers who have been at the forefront of this movement. We hear from youth activists from Canada, the UK, and the United States. Future webinars will focus on engaging youth from around the world, particularly the global south. We'll also hear from a handful of Indigenous and non-Indigenous adult allies and supporters that are working hand in hand with these movements, including a local Coast Salish elder and matriarch from the Tilly Nation, Rose Henry. We're going to conduct the conversation in the format of a talking circle, which is a traditional Indigenous method, with the key difference that for the purposes of the online audience, my fellow co-moderator Keith and I will introduce each presenter before they speak. For the first round, each presenter will speak for five minutes about the work they're doing in the movements they're part of. During the presentations, the comment box will disappear to make room for photos and slides that the presenters will be sharing with the audience. But after the first round, we'll move to several rounds of discussion following the same talking circle order, and the comment box will be back up and live for all of you online participants to ask questions, make comments, and jump into the conversation. And with that, I'll introduce our first two speakers joining us today from Victoria Lepungan Territories. Our first speakers are Emily Thiessen, who's a cartoonist and illustrator and grassroots climate activist who's fired up about the Green New Deal, and Antonia Paquin, who's a environmental studies student here at the University of Victoria and a grassroots climate activist working on youth climate strikes and the Green New Deal. Hi everyone. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, great. Um, hey, my name is Emily. Thanks so much for having me. And it's really neat to see people tuning in from like Brazil and Spain in particular and all these international places. Um, so I've grown up here and I'm really grateful um, all the time to have grown up on these territories that have been stewarded since time immemorial by the Lekwungen and Stanich people. You can't really see the background because I'm just in the office, but it's really gorgeous here. Um, I've been worried about the climate since I was probably like eight or ten years old. Um, and I started thinking a bit more about social justice in high school, but I really started doing climate organizing in university. In my very first semester, um, I got recruited into Divest Ubik which is part of this global movement um, to demand that educational institutions around the world stop investing in the fossil fuel industry. Um, and I learned so much from that, just about how to organize, like how to write a press release, all of these really good skills. Um, and I also learned a lot about how climate is a social justice issue. Like I remember seeing this map of the world of the countries that have contributed the most to climate change and the countries that will suffer the worst effects of climate change. And those maps are like an inverse of each other. Um, and that kind of image has stuck with me ever since, especially thinking about people in like the Arctic and the equator where my family in Malaysia lives and how they'll be affected by climate change. Um, yeah, and so I went hard with Diversity Vic for a few years. Um, and then my last year of university, I thought, no, you know, I need to focus on school for once because this is like my last year of my undergrad. I need to get good grades. Um, and so I tried to like take a step back from organizing. but. That plan didn't go so well because about like a month into my last year, um, construction started on the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which was then owned by Kinder Morgan. And so for a few months, I just got like kind of all this like pent up anger and anxiety about that construction going on to basically triple the capacity um, of this pipeline to export what is some of the most high um, greenhouse gas emitting oil produced in the world, which comes from the Alberta oil sands. Um, and so in December, I ran to this friend on campus and he's like, did you hear that there is this group of people that are going to blockade the facility where they're, where they're building right now, which was the um, Kinder Morgan Marine Terminal in Burnaby? And I said, okay, I need to find out who these people are because <laughs> I want to do that. Um, and that's how I met Keith. Um, and so we did this, this blockade at the tanker terminal and that turned into a, a grassroots um, 
um, climate group called Rise and Resist, which is still going on today. Um, so this was last year, January. And those few months from like January to the summer 2018 were really intense because the construction just like kept going on um, in Burnaby, um, which is, by the way, it's a suburb of Vancouver, which is across from Victoria um, for international folks. Um, and so we were going really hard, like send, busing people and sending people on the ferries over to Burnaby to stop the construction and also doing um, local direct actions in Victoria. Um, I like followed Catherine, we followed Catherine McKenna around and disrupted a press conference that she did, things like that. Um, and then after a few months of that, a couple of things happened. So one was that um, there was a court order that stopped construction because several nations whose territories the pipeline was being built on successfully lodged a case that said they hadn't been consulted properly. And so the construction stopped, and I also graduated from university. Um, and I was in Malaysia, and I was spending some time just thinking about, like, what am I doing with the rest of my life now? And um, around that time, the Sunrise Movement in the United States was really taking off in a big way after they occupied Nancy Pelosi's office demanding a Green New Deal. Um, and the Green New Deal is basically it's a vision to transition completely off of fossil fuels within the time frame that science demands to keep to the world from warming more than 1.5 degrees Celsius, um, while at the same time enshrining justice and dignity for all and making sure that there's good work available. Um, and I read some articles about Sunrise, and it was founded by people kind of like me who had started off as campus divestment organizers. Um, and then graduated and realized that actually nothing they had been doing, like they had sometimes won huge victories, getting their universities to lie best, but they realized that nothing they were doing was actually enough. Like even if they won their campaign, what they were doing wasn't going to even make a dent in the climate crisis. And that um, they were thinking about like, what do we actually need to do to keep the Earth from warming more than 1.5 degrees? And that really struck a chord with me. Um, and so recently, like, I'm still really dedicated to stopping Trans Mountain, but I've also turned to Green New Deal organizing, which for me is about building a massive, massive movement. Um, like the kind that I don't think I've ever seen in my lifetime. Probably the biggest movement I've seen is Occupy, and it would need to be even bigger. Um, like something that has the people power that it would take to actually um, transition our economy in the time it would need. And so in Victoria, what we're just doing locally is forming a coalition um, trying to get outside of our environmental bubble and team up with a couple of union locals and a church um, and different social groups um, on coming up with what a Green New Deal would look like locally here um, and also tapping into the movement across Canada. Um, and there's a really exciting movement called Our Time, which is happening led by youth and millennials across Canada right now. And if anyone's interested in the climate movement in Canada, this would be, I think, the one thing I would keep my eye on because there's like this coordinated youth-led effort um, to push for a massive movement. Um, and I didn't get my slides in on time, but I can put a link to them in the comments and a couple of links um, other links as well if you want to take a look at them. I'll pass it off to Antonia, who also organizes with us here in the Congo Territories. Hey, everyone. Yeah, thanks all for tuning in today. Um, I just want to start off by acknowledging that I also uh, reside on unceded territories and um, what comes with that is a responsibility to continually educate myself and then also a responsibility to um, share um, in these conversations about what it means to be um, a person of settler European descent residing on uh, unceded territory. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I'm really honored to uh, try to walk with as much awareness as possible and then bring that awareness into, um, into like, every action that we do. Um, and all this work in terms of climate justice also involves, first and foremost, justice, justice for indigenous people, the original caretakers of this land. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I'll also speak on how I got involved with all of this work of um, climate activism. Um, it wasn't my whole life that I was really passionate and involved in this work. It was actually somewhat recently that I had this epiphany moment when after a long time of feeling overwhelmed at the 
intensity of our modern globalized industrial world uh, with crazy amounts of pollution and plastic in the oceans. But how are we ever going to solve these problems when we're just empowered, young, uh, disempowered young people um, when these problems are so enormous? Um, but then making a shift from feeling that we aren't able to make a difference and we're alone and all these problems are insurmountable to taking a second and like really thinking about the fact that actually there's enormous power in a vision for a world that is more just and a world that is equitable and where we are living in harmony and in service of a planet and not trying to dominate the planet. We actually do have enormous capacity to create change and even more power if we team up with other people who are also working towards creating a better world in a very real, meaningful, grounded way. Um, and so I had this awakening moment of like, you know what, I can actually make a difference uh, back, in, uh, back in December and then uh, and then I moved to the Kwangin territory at uh, Victoria on Vancouver Island in Canada in January and then um, encountered these incredible uh, people, Keith and Emily with Rise and Resist, and then all these incredible youth involved in the Victoria Youth Climate Strike. And, um, and uh, being part of that was incredible, um, especially when we had these uh, two global strikes. Uh, on March 15th in Victoria, we had about 2,000 young people come out, and the energy was absolutely revolutionary feeling. And what's cool about this movement with young people rising up all over the world is that, as has been said before, young people have always been at the forefront of change because we feel very immediately the enormity of the situation, and we're not afraid to confront the fullness of what that means. And not only that, but we're also bold and creative people, uh, whereas, I'm not going to say all older people, but maybe young people have more capacity for, you know, being like, no, here's the solution, it's right ahead in front of us, um, we're going to go for it, there's nothing that's stopping us. Um, and uh, there's this fire and fierceness in young people uh, that I think a lot of the world is really feeling right now, and a lot of the world is looking to youth to lead the way in this movement. And it just makes sense. Um, so uh, I'm quite involved with the Victoria Youth Climate Strikes and also involved with the Green New Deal, as Emily was mentioning. Um, I'm also really into urban agriculture uh, and food security. Uh, I think one of the big issues that is going to be confronting us in the next decades is water and food. Um, so as much as possible in terms of becoming self-sufficient, um, if we are growing our own food, if we have really an energy democracy and um, we're sufficient in terms of our water and um, food sourcing, then we'll get the power away from large corporations and um, reconnect with our own sense of um, agency. So uh, urban agriculture is, I think, a big part of that. And it's also nice to reconnect with the source of our food. Um, I'm also really involved with indigenous rights work um, and decolonization. Uh, Emily mentioned this pipeline um, that they're trying to push through again, the Trans Mountain Pipeline, which is the renamed version of that Kendra Morgan pipeline. Uh, we, last weekend on Saturday, marched uh, a tiny house down the highway, it was a 30 kilometer march, not all on the highway, but this tiny house movement is um, building tiny houses and putting them in the pathway of the pipeline. And it's also an effort to, um, re for indigenous people to reoccupy their homelands. Um, so another thing that I'm really involved with is um, women's empowerment. I feel that a lot of this movement is about um, is about reconnecting with feminine ways of knowing. Um, smash the patriarchy, basically. Um, but what that involves for me, in my opinion, is um, is uh, there's a fierceness that exists in women, a fire that trains in our bellies, 
Um, and if we ignite that collectively and feel a sense of collective empowerment in terms of uh, exercising feminine, feminine ways of knowing and like what um, leadership can look like, if it's not done in a masculine way, it can look really different. Um, I'm not saying that women are better than men, that's not what I'm arguing. I think men also suffer from this masculine patriarchal society in terms of their feminine aspects not being able to be fully expressed. Um, but an interesting example of this is that this youth climate strike movement is mostly led by young women. Um, and, uh, and it's really amazing to see that um, climate justice involves like rights of indigenous people, involves women's empowerment, um, and the empowerment of marginalized people. Um, there's also a, a really important space for humanness and compassion and empathy right now. Um, more, more than ever, we need authenticity and we need to help each other um, through this because there are a lot of mental health problems that come up with, um, with, with the scariness of our situation. Um, so we need to hold space for each other and be raw and real and human with each other uh, and hold space for discomfort as well because the transition is going to be uh, about questioning many aspects of our beliefs and values um, and the way our societies are run. So helping each other um, and like really listening with our hearts and speaking with our hearts. And now I'm sounding like a hippie, but I think it's important. <laughs> Anyway, so I'll leave it there for now. Um, I think that uh, I won't be able to speak again because I need to head out. I'm at a conference working with Indigenous and non-Indigenous youth, um, talking about what reconciliation can mean. Um, and so I'm going to hit the road. But thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And looking forward to continuing working with you guys in this incredibly important issue. Much love. Thanks so much for joining us, Antonia. And thanks, Emily, for sharing as well. Wow, what an inspiring start. Just uh, go right into our next speakers, who are Roseanne Steffen and Mary Jane Farrell, who are both university students and organizers with Youth Strike for Climate in Brighton, United Kingdom. Hello, uh, nice to meet everyone. Um, yeah, we're Roseanne and Mary Jane. Um, we're from Youth Strike for Climate, um, which is called different things around the world. In the UK, we call it Youth Strike for Climate. Um, for those of you who don't know, it's a movement led by young people striking from school, college, or university to demand government action on climate change. Um, so here in the UK, we've been striking every month since February. Um, but as people may have heard, it's a global movement which was kick-started I guess by the then 15-year-old Greta Thunberg from Sweden. Um, she started a strike from her school every Friday last year. Um, on March the 15th, we saw over 1.5 million young people worldwide take to the streets, which was amazing to be a part of. Um, so yeah, we're part of the UK movement, um, but specifically we represent the Brighton region, which is where we coordinate from and where we both study. Um, our team in Brighton has grown massively since the first strike, um, ranging from primary school age to university age, which is really, really nice to work with such a diverse range of people in the youth generation. Um, so this photo is from our first strike in February, which saw around 2,000 people take to the streets, which is amazing for a small place like Brighton. Um, so we marched to a local park where we had speeches from local politicians, young people, academics, performers, um, yeah, a really huge range of people. Um, so for the global strike in March, we had almost double that of February. Um, and this sort of inspired us to reach out to some Friday for Future activists from, from, the, from the European Union. Um, so we travelled in March, just after our March strike, um, to Belgium, to the European Parliament, to meet with 12 other Friday for Future activists from Netherlands, Germany, uh, Belgium, Sweden, and we were basically learning a bit more about European climate policy and the European Union as a whole. 
um, on how it like works and functions. Um, we were invited by the um, Democratic and Socialist Alliance, which is a coalition within the European Parliament, um, and it was particularly run by these two MEPs called Arne Lutz and Heidi Akatuna. Um, and yeah, we were really inspired by, well, we were really, really grateful for the knowledge that they gave us, and it was really fascinating. But we did feel a little bit like the relationship was was not quite equal, um, so it was more um, a kind of a relationship of them expecting us to listen to what they had to say and not quite listening to us on our own part. So we decided to do a little protest <laughs> in the plenary of the European Parliament to to kind of raise awareness of climate justice because that we did we felt that that wasn't really being addressed in the um, sort of European climate policy framework. Um, so we've decided we yeah we started doing a little protest started BP shut down BP <laughs> within the part of the plenary building and we got politely asked to leave um, and we were out on the steps of the European Parliament and we were you know just chanting away and we attracted the attention of like 50 uh, Swedish um, young activists from like around the age of 14 15 and they were from the Swedish Green Party it's like youth delegates um, and they're really they just came over to us and asked us what we were doing and who we were um, and, we, and they decided to join in with our protest and then we just all went to the park and just had the most amazing conversations about our experiences of striking and what we wanted to do in the future um, and I think for us what was so special like it stood out as the highlight of our trip meeting these other young activists so like spontaneous spontaneously and I think that's the kind of power in the movement is to form these coalitions and like in the most unexpected places and it felt like the power was felt like it was so much stronger and more inspiring out of the traditional halls of power in, like for example in the European Parliament so yeah it was a really awesome experience um, yeah it was it was a good experience um, so yeah that leads us to um, last Friday when we had our fifth strike um, in the lead up to the strike, we held a climate justice workshop, um, which was hosted by ourselves and a social justice organization called Global Justice Now. Um, we wanted to talk about what climate justice really means, that it's not just about our future as the young generation in the UK, but that this crisis is happening now and disproportionately affecting people who have contributed the least to the crisis. So we talked about acknowledging activists um, who've been fighting long before us and those risking their lives now to defend the land, um, recognising our differing privileges in this movement. Um, the group ranged from about 12 years old mm -hmm. to late 20s, which was really, really nice. It was amazing to break down these hierarchies and barriers between the youth generation, as it is really wide and you can get academic knowledge can be complex, but we broke it down and everyone was very respectful of who was in the space and stuff. Um, so it was, it was really, really great. And yeah, so we talked about cap capitalism, colonialism and intersectionality in an accessible way, um, making a clear link with climate change. Um, so the response to the workshop was to create a banner to lead the march. And so you can see here, this is what um, people created. So it says colonialism plus capitalism equals climate breakdown. Um, so yeah, that's, that's the most recent thing that's happened. We are currently putting our efforts into the general strike, which here in the UK um, is on the 20th of September, but we'll have a week of events and actions leading up to the 27th of September as well. So yeah, that's kind of the next thing we're working, working on. Thank you so much. It's so inspiring to hear about everything happening and everything is moving so quickly. There's so many actions happening every day, every moment all around the world right now. It's really exciting to hear. I'm so happy to be introducing Samantha and Carolyn Noor from California. They're joining us from California today. Samantha is a 12-year-old climate justice organizer and a leader with Youth versus Apocalypse and Warriors for Justice. Youth vs. Apocalypse is a diverse group of young climate justice activists working together to lift the voices of youth, in particular, youth of color, and, and they also fight for a livable climate and an equitable, sustainable, and just world. Carolyn Noor is an adult supporter of Youth vs. Apocalypse. She believes that intergenerational organizing is a powerful model in organizing for climate justice and that adults have the joy 
and responsibility of directly supporting youth and fighting for a livable planet. Welcome, Samantha and Carolyn. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having us here um, and for everyone else that's spoken as well. Um, so we're joining from Oakland, California. Uh, I'm Carolyn Samantha. Um, we, I just to acknowledge um, where we're living is unceded Ohlone, Chichenyo Ohlone territory. So um, we want to acknowledge that and also acknowledge that Oakland is one of the most diverse areas in the U.S., if not in the world, where we have people literally from all over the world making their homes here in Oakland. Um, and we also have an extremely unequal society where we have huge um, camps of people without homes in our city and also very wealthy people in our city. So the context where we're organizing is one of not only global inequality, but also within our city. It's a very present reality all the time. And so um, I'll give a little bit of framing of the group, and then Samantha can talk about some of the um, activism that she's worked on. Um, basically, what I want to say is that, especially in our society in in the U.S. Um, and in California and Oakland, uh, I feel like there's such an important role for adults to support youth, and in particularly to make sure that youth who come from backgrounds that are often marginalized or silenced are heard in the U.S. So um, we have a society where right now our government is putting um, children from certain areas in concentration camps and denying them the right to toothbrushes and sleep and bed. Um, so that's very present for us. We have a society with police brutality and violence and den violence that's very present in our city. Um, we have people, our government threatening raids of deportation in our city last weekend and now in two weeks. So we're organizing in a context where there's so much inequality and so much social injustice that's so directly tied to um, our work for climate justice. So a lot of what I do as an adult supporter and as a um, white ally to communities of color as well is making sure that students from these um, communities that are often pushed out, we just our Supreme Court just ruled it's legal to gerrymander and allow people not to have their votes counted from certain areas. So a lot of what I do is going into schools and directly supporting. And when I say direct support, I mean things like um, not only providing information, um, but also providing snacks and rides. Um, so we had a, um, a climate march in, um, a climate strike in March of this year in San Francisco, but because of the nature of our society, there is literally no way for youth from East Oakland, which is where Samantha and I live, which is a more um, both diverse and economically less well-off area, um, there's no way for them to get to San Francisco to do a climate strike, even though it's about, um, in a car it's 15 minutes, in tra public transportation it's maybe 20, 25 minutes, but the bus, the BART tickets, which is like the subway, are $10 round trip, which is prohibitive for many students. We have um, truancy police that pick up students of color who aren't in school um, and bring them to this, this detention center in Oakland. So, like, what it means to strike and organize for youth of color in the U.S., it means that to do that safely, even with, like, you know, a minimal level of safety does require adult support. So we had another student who I supported in creating a GoFundMe um, and shared that with the network. So we raised $10,000 to get school buses for youth from Oakland to actually be able to get to the climate strike, um, which changed who was able to be heard. And it changed when we did speeches, what issues were brought up, and people were talking about climate justice. And it's not just how it looks. It's literally what ideas are brought up and what solutions are put forward. And what communities are consulted on that. So a lot of my work is around just trying to create the opportunity for youth to fight for their own communities. Um, I think Samantha will talk more about the organizing work she did in also making sure that all communities were represented at our last climate strike. And then a lot of the other work we do with Youth Versus Apocalypse is focused on climate, but it's focused on it at a local level as well. So um, working on 
preventing a developer from building a massive coal export terminal in the port of Oakland in a neighborhood called West Oakland, which is also an economically disadvantaged community, um, whereas the developer himself lives up in the hills. He's being financed by the coal companies, um, and he's in the process of trying to build the coal terminal against the decision of our local government. He's trying to overturn that decision in federal court because our federal system is not um, very democratic right now in the U.S. Um, and so working on the coal terminal, working on getting our local air district to um, regulate refineries. We have big oil and gas refineries in the North Bay, also in communities of color, where um, people in those areas, like in West Oakland and East Oakland, literally have like a lower life expectancy than people born in um, more wealthy areas within the Bay Area. So we have a really disproportionate um, environmental justice situation, which is what allows our climate crisis to get to the level that it's at. So I feel like my role as an adult and as an ally who has relatively more privilege to do things like move around, have access to internet and computers and cars to move around um, and snacks to provide is really just to support youth in being able to have the logistical assistance they need and the support that they need, the encouragement that they need to make their voices heard. And when that support is provided, there's so much brilliance and power from these communities that have had to resist, have had to learn to um, survive and thrive under hostile circumstances for a very long time. So my role is a supporter, um, and I'm really honored to work with these like Samantha. I that. I Samantha. Hi, my name is Samantha. I work with both youth groups, Youth vs. Apocalypse, and another group called Warriors for Justice that's part of my middle school. I've been involved, I became involved because of the issue that Carolyn brought up with the developer that is trying to build a coal terminal in our city. And it really, it's important to bring up the fact that it's kind of going together with environmental racism because where I live, it's a mainly color, a people of color group. And a lot of us suffer from asthma. So it's kind of like saying if we were all equal, there would be no place to dump the toxins in. If we were all equal, there would be no people's graves to dig up like the indigenous people. If we were all equal, we wouldn't have to be suffering through this crisis. And I don't know really what to bring up. Maybe just talk about your organizing for the climate strike. Okay. So with the climate strike, we had in March, we had about 2,000 youth in San Francisco that marched from Nancy Pelosi's office to Diane Feinstein's office into another plaza where we held speeches and stuff. And a particular role that I had was trying to get students from my middle school to go there. And we only managed to get our sixth grade to go there because I was currently in, I was in seventh grade when that happened. And there was a strong resistance from our teachers who were saying that we would use that chance to skip school, and when it's not educational, it's not a part of our curricular uh, curriculum, and it's kind of funny because it's about saving our future, and I think that's not just a part of our curriculum, but trying to live. And no, only sixth grade got to go, and eighth grade was not going, but we still went to San Francisco, and I had a petition where I was having our seventh graders sign on so that the principal would allow us to go. But despite that, I was threatened by different teachers not to do that and how they did not want it. And one of our teachers was threatening to lower grades if some kids managed to make it to San Francisco. So it's not really fair that that had to happen to our youth, which really brings up the point that even if we tried, we can't get to San Francisco on our own, which leads to adult supporters trying to fund our trips and stuff like that. So they had gotten school buses to go, and they had organized the youth to go, but the teachers were threatening them. They confiscated Samantha's petition that she'd gotten three-quarters of the seventh grade class to sign. Um, and so it was really direct kind of counter-organizing from, from the teachers at the school um, to prevent youth from going and threatening that they call their families and that they lower their grades and all these things that they did attend. But still, Samantha was able to get a bunch of youth to go besides the sixth graders that were allowed to go. Um, and we met in a park and were able to go. Um, and do you want to talk about, like, talking to Diane Feinstein? Or oh, I was part of the youth that went inside Diane Feinstein's office to confront her about signing on to the Green New Deal. 
And there she told us that we had we could not do that, that the Green New Deal would not pass, that because we can't vote, we don't have a say in this issue. And she passed on to us her own Green New Deal, her own resolution that was not sufficient enough to save our environment. And so we held a press conference, and there was a lot of pressure from different medias. So she withdrew her um, proposal, which is kind of a win because we don't want that proposal. And here in the slides, we have two like 50 feet murals that I helped design and paint in San Francisco when we had this big action where there was multiple like 50. They said around 75 murals that were going on at the same time that happened at city, San Francisco City Hall around there. And we have protect our kids, climate, and migrants, which kind of shows the intersectionality that you need to include in activism, including not only the climate, but the people that are going to be um, affected by it and our youth who are going to be living through that future. And another one is do or die, take action, because if we don't take action now, we are going to go away. And just to add to them, in the do or die mural, there's there's like coal plants in the background, and then the one in the front is, this was painted last September, and it's a, it's supposed to represent a child who um, has a butterfly symbol, which is a migration symbol, also a climate symbol, because we have monarch butterflies that are going extinct here. Um, and it's also a symbol of migration, because they pass from up and down the west coast of the U.S. and Canada and Mexico. Um, and so that's representing a child that's taken from their parents and being held in a cage or concentration camp, however you, <laughs> however you should phrase what the U.S. government is doing to children. So there's a lot of intersectionality that comes out in our movement as well. Wow, thanks so much for sharing. I'd like to welcome to our webinar uh, Tilamine Elder and Matriarch Rose Henry, who is a beloved community leader here on the Klungan Territory. She's been on the board of the Victoria Native Friendship Center, the Together Against Poverty Society, and the uh, Vancouver Island Human Rights Coalition. She's also recently been recognized as one of 50 Coast Salish water protectors, and she's uh, an intergenerational leader in the fight against the Trans Mountain Pipeline. Thanks for joining us, Rose. Oh, Rose, I think you have to unmute your microphone. You'll see a button just to the top there where you can take yourself off mute. Still can't hear you there, Rose. Just at the very top of your screen, you'll see a, a green picture of a microphone that you're going to have to click on. We hear that if you click it off and then on again, that sometimes can help with the tech. We're still not able to hear, unfortunately. We're having trouble with other uh, speakers earlier, so. We're, um, so Rose, um, can you try a quick, uh, yeah, hmm, I wonder, Suggest. Maybe we'll uh, uh, try and sort this out with Rose while our next speaker speaks, and uh, hopefully we'll have Rose able to speak just after that. Uh, so next we'll ask Danny Noonan to speak for a moment, who's uh, with our Children's Trust Global Program, and also supporting the groundbreaking Juliana case coming out of the United States and working on other similar legal challenges uh, to help you push for climate action around the world. Take it away, Danny. All right, thanks everyone. Um, it's great to be speaking with you all today. Um, I, I just wanted to give a very quick uh, overview of the work we do at Our Children's Trust um, and um, Leave it at that. Uh, but before I start, I would like to acknowledge, and, and I think it's really great we are acknowledging um, what in Australia we would call the traditional owners 
um, of the land where we all are. And so um, I, I'm currently based in Eugene, Oregon, and that the traditional owners of that land are the Kalapulia and uh, several other groups. And um, when I lived in Sydney, I, I was on the traditional land of the, uh, the Garigal and the Gadigal people of the, the Aura Nation. And I just want to acknowledge um, and pay my respects to the elders, past and present of that land, and acknowledge that that land was never ceded. So our Children's Trust was founded in 2010 uh, with the vision of supporting young climate activists and, and youth leaders um, in, in, a, in a campaign to secure uh, through the courts their right to a safe climate uh, for themselves and for future generations. And um, today I just want to give a quick overview of the work we do at our Children's Trust um, and how it links with the broader movement of youth climate justice activism, which has really exploded in the last uh, 12 to 24 months, although, as, as Rebecca mentioned, it's um, been a movement that's actually been going on for some time, and also talk a little bit about the theory of change that we promote at our Children's Trust. And so, as you'll see on the slide, all the legal cases we support and all the work we do at our Children's Trust is essentially guided by these three core principles. And so, in short, we seek to elevate the voice of young people to bring legal actions that seek systemic, science-based emissions reductions from governments and in order to protect their fundamental constitutional and human rights. And so the most well-known of our cases is Juliana v. United States, which is a, a lawsuit where 21 young people from across the United States have alleged that the US government's long-standing knowledge of the catastrophic risks of climate change in conjunction with their systemic actions supporting, subsidizing, and promoting the extraction and consumption and transport of fossil fuels and of fossil fuel infrastructure have uh, led to dangerously high levels of greenhouse gases in our atmosphere that in turn have caused catastrophic climate change impacts to the constitutional rights of our plaintiffs, in particular their rights to life, liberty, property, personal security, bodily, uh, bodily integrity, and uh, family autonomy. But the Juliana case is not the only legal action that we've supported. Um, and so in addition to that case, there's been numerous lawsuits that we've helped support young people bring in state courts within the United States, and we've also helped um, support uh, youth-led systemic legal actions in a host of countries throughout the world, uh, several of which you can see on this slide. And I've also just put together a, a sort of rough map that shows uh, in teal the places in which young people have already stepped up and brought these types of systemic climate change lawsuits against their governments. And then uh, also I wanted to show in purple um, the places where individuals and groups other than young people, but that may also include young people, such as NGOs and um, groups like that, have brought similar um, kinds of lawsuits. So sort of in parallel with this growing um, activism and movements in the streets, we're also seeing a growing movement in the courts to um, seek to protect fundamental rights from um, climate catastrophe. And, but I also wanted to sort of emphasize that the legal actions are just one piece of the work we do here at our Children's Trust. And, and we've really realized and carried with us from the beginning that in order for our work to make a sort of broader impact, it, it needs to build and be supported by a movement. Um, and so each sort of major milestone in our cases has been accompanied by mobilization of the local uh, national and international level through things like press conferences and rallies and related oh, action. And then, so this slide is, is our rally um, okay, thank uh, you. on October 29, 2018 last year, which was supposed to mark the beginning of the trial in the Juliana case, but the US Supreme Court stepped in uh, 10 days before this date and issued a temporary stay. Um, and so this slide just shows some photos from the rally we had uh, on June 4th in, in Portland, Oregon, um, which was a hearing before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in, in the same case. And you know, through these events and actions, we've been building partnerships with other organizations in the movement, including 
um, 350.org, Earth Guardians, uh, Indigenous leaders and groups, um, the US Youth Climate Strike Movement, and the Sunrise Movement. Um, and we're also working with uh, legislatures and, and allies in the US Congress and encouraging them to show their support uh, for the case in different ways, including through social media. And we're also building a brand or, or you know, creating art and you know, um, messaging around the case that you know, helps um, distill the sometimes very sort of complex and esoteric legal arguments into a sort of clear and understandable messaging for, for the public and for the broader movement. And an example of this is our uh, podcast, which is called No Ordinary Lawsuit, which I'd encourage you to listen to. Uh, and, and finally, uh, just because you know, there are a number of people here from Canada, I just wanted to mention that we are in the midst of supporting uh, lawyers and young people in Canada in developing and filing a case that will be based on the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms and, and make very similar arguments to those that have been made in Juliana about government knowledge and support for fossil fuels. So if you're interested in learning more about the lawsuit and potentially participating in it, um, I'd encourage you to uh, contact um, either myself or our plaintiff engagement coordinator, Joe Rogers, at, at that address. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Hello. All right. Thanks so much. Uh, Rose, it looks like you have your microphone figured out now. Would you like to speak? I sure would. Great. Yeah. So, just hang on. I I'm getting an echo here, <laughs> but hey, I am so pleased to see um, so many people speaking about um, our climate change. Now I'm really getting at it. There we go. So. Because now's the time that we actually should be doing a lot. And over the last few years, I've been saying that our youth should be um, continuously attending our rallies and that when we're at rallies, that we should make space for our Indigenous people as well as for our young people. And over the last 40 years, I've noticed that there's been a real drastic drop in the number of young people attending rallies up until about two years ago. And all of a sudden now people are realizing that we are in a crisis. We're at the critical stage and we need to change our climate direction. So. It's like, okay, well, it's our youth that are going to save the rest of the world. So, and it's like, we start with making the changes, first of all, by acknowledging the territory that we're on. So I always tell people, no matter where you're at, acknowledge the people of the land the indigenous communities. Like for myself, I am from the Telelem Nation and I currently reside here on the Songhees and the Esquimalt territory and have been fighting for social change since I was 14 years old. And so in the last 50 years, I began to identify what the um, social change looks like. And I see major intersects of, um, you know, between our pipeline, the pipeline that we don't want going through, and the missing and murdered people. I see um, the drastic changes in the climate change and how the lack of action by our the current leaders and our um, voting public has failed. And so now it's like, okay, 
the rest of the world is looking at First Nations people and our youth to save our climate. And this is the, these are the very two groups that have been oppressed and denied the right to make these changes. And so it's like, you know, I have, I have some very critical statements about this, right? And so I'm looking at how do we empower our youth? We empower them by giving them the mic, by bringing them to rallies. We empower them by um, giving them permission to use the tools that they already have. Because we have less than 12 years to make changes for the climate. That's only three elections. So the kids that are old enough right now to be um, in this conference that should be here are the ones that are now 15, 16, 17 years old because they're going to be the ones that are be old enough to vote in the next two elections. Here on the Canadian side, we have a federal election in six months. On the U.S. side, two years. So they've already started their election campaigns. On the international level, all the leaders are scrambling trying to make buddies with um, other countries. And they're putting climate change on the plate right now. But it's only words. It's not just, um, you know, dollars. I don't, I don't know. I'm at a loss for it because I've been listening to too much of uh, Donald Trump's empty promises and Trudeau's. So what we did this past weekend, we're now receiving um, feedback from the community. When we moved the tiny house with 300 activists, we went um, 22 kilometers, which is equivalent to about 15 miles with a tiny house down the main highway. That tiny house is now on its way up north with a totem pole that's being towed behind it. And we're saying, these tiny houses are going to be built right on the pipeline because we're doing our best to stop the pipeline. And we need to do more. I know we need to do more. But we need to have more of these conferences. We need to have a major day of action. I've already started looking at that process of what that day of action would look like. Like what we did with Idle No More and um, the Rise and Resist actions. If we looked at the month of October to have a day of action to shut down all the cashiers or the coffee shops. There's a whole, a whole bunch of things that we could do. And it's like, where do, you know, like, let's start. Let's start with this, this conference. So I'd like to, I'd like to see if we can get a mobilizing day of action. and really delivered the, the message loud and clear. So I actually watched a video from about four days ago where one of the communities actually took a, um, a giant drill and started drilling on their politicians' front lawns and saying, this is what the um, pipeline looks like. But there's other actions that we need to do around the pipeline stuff. It's like also the water. 
We need to look at how climate change is affecting our water, our oceans, our air. When I drive around our community and on our island here, I see how sick the trees are. I also see you know, the importance of saving the trees. I also see the, the power of our youth and our Indigenous communities working together. So I'd like to actually turn this mic back over to the other people and see what ideas we can come up with. Thank you so much. Okay, so I'm going to shut the mic off right now and see if I can fix my own echo problem here. Thank you so much, Rose. Uh, so um, wonderful to hear um, from you about everything you've been doing since you were yourself a youth activist starting at the age of 14. And uh, definitely on the next round, I think this, this conversation about how to coordinate and what kinds of actions we can do um, is a wonderful thing for us to talk about. Before we move to the second round, though, um, I'd like to introduce Kiana Alexander, who is a mixed heritage woman of European and Métis ancestry, and currently a guest on the unceded ancestral territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh people. Kiana is a proud Métis, a skew, a storyteller, a creative thinker, a researcher, and a director of the Emerging Leader Program at the Raven Institute, among many, many other roles. Thank you so much for joining us, Kiana. Yeah, thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me all right? Yeah, good. Um, wonderful. Well, um, Tante Kiowao, hello to you all. Um, it's an honor to be here and to have um, spent the past hour um, witnessing and, and listening to, to all of the really incredible uh, work that's being done. As Rebecca mentioned, um, I am um, a very proud Métis woman with homelands rooted in Fort Chippewan, northern Alberta, a very small um, community, which for most of the year is a fly-in, fly-out community, uh, except for about three months of the year where there is uh, an ice road that, that you can get to the community from, from northern Alberta. Um, but I've had the privilege to grow up here on the un seated, unsurrendered uh, traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. Um, and as we conduct this meeting currently, uh, at the, uh, residing on the uh, territory of Tawasim peoples, Tawasim First Nations. So, um, yeah, I think it's really interesting to um, be able to hear um, and witness and, and be in a space, an online space, where um, every person has um, recognized uh, who who they are and also where they are in this time as we convene this conversation. And um, thank you, Rose, for uh, sharing your wisdom and, and being a part of this conversation. I um, have a bit of a, a different but, but similar take to kind of this conversation in the work that I'm doing um, and in the um, privilege that I have to work alongside um, youth, but particularly um, Indigenous youth. Um, and here in, in Vancouver, um, work particularly with urban Indigenous youth. And it's been an interesting path to really, um, for both myself and, and the young people that I have the privilege to work with, um, of really seeing in this time of understanding the sense of urgency to um, take action around climate, but to also um, see the inter, the deep, deeply woven interconnectedness to understanding um, who we are and where we come from, um, and the the reclamation of our traditional teachings um, and how that plays into uh, what what the world is calling for in this time. Um, and the role of um, indigenous people and allies and the and, and the interconnectedness to us having the ability to know and understand um, who we are and where we come from and how that plays a really deeply um, 
interconnected role to how we view our, our connectedness to, to the land um, and to what's happening to the land. Um, and um, for me, I know in my journey, um, being uh, passionate about um, what what's happening to our earth um, wasn't always at the forefront of, of what I was most passionate about. Um, but it was when I started reconnecting with uh, my teachings and, and reconnecting with people um, um, in my family and my relatives and understanding that um, what's happening to the planet, what's happening to um, the things around us is, is happening to each and every one of us as we are all um, connected and we are not separate than uh, what is happening to the land or what is happening to us as, as peoples um, is, is the same thing. And um, I have the privilege to uh, know and, and um, love um, a young um, youth from the Squamish Nation who shares the teachings that she learned in uh, learned in Dene da territory about um, this also reclamation of, of understanding the concept of consent um, and our our big disconnection to understanding um, connect, the the concept of consent both with our bodies and, and how we are and how we live our lives and also um, our lack of understanding consent around the land. And how we've gotten to a place of um, of becoming so disconnected from that in 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 mainstream society and um, in in my teachings in in my culture, um, it's you know vitally important when you take from the land or when you are um, camping or or anything like that where where the where the land is hosting you and and uh, that there's this uh, strong responsibility for that to be rooted in reciprocity of honoring the land uh, for for what you have taken from it and and giving back. And I, when I think back to that, I think about um, in the in the state that we're in, how far disconnected we've become from um, that idea of of understanding. Um, how we live our lives as as peoples, as communities, as as diverse peoples all all over, um, that resurgence and and reclamation to understanding who we are and our level of connectedness to our own um, our own identities, our own cultures, uh, no matter who you are and where you come from, um, is deeply interconnected to our ability to be connected to the land, um, and this kind of parallel. Um, thing that is happening right now, parallel kind of resurgence and, and rise of, of understanding and acknowledging, as has been done in this webinar, um, who, who we are, where we come from, um, if, if we are guests on land, acknowledging that place and space, um, and also acknowledging who we are and, and where we come from. And I think it's, it's in that, um, this, this path that I'm on and have the privilege to be on with a lot of young people uh, here, a lot of urban Indigenous folks um, of that, that deeply interconnected journey to returning to a connectedness with oneself, connectedness with each other, um, is also part of the healing that will have um, us contribute to understanding the, the sense of urgency and, and the healing that's needed for our world. Um, and that comes in so many different ways and, and shapes and forms. And, and again, I think our ability to, to connect with one another, um, especially with this, this um, huge sense of urgency that has been alluded to in the, in the 12 years and the work that each and every one of you on this webinar has, has spoken to, um, is this ability to, um, to, to get to the root faster of, of where and how we connect as, as peoples because there's this, this immense sense of urgency uh, that, that we're all feeling. Um, and I think um, I did a talk recently um, um, at, the, at the Raven Institute. We also have a program called Raven Speak, which, who, which vision, whose vision uh, is Indigenous leaders and storytellers, visible, masterful, amplified, and connected. And we um, support um, 
Indigenous change makers of all genders to go through a program to connect to one another and their stories and, and share their stories um, in a platform. Um, in a, it's a similar style to kind of a, a, a public forum or a TEDx type thing, but specifically for uh, Indigenous change makers. And um, one of the things that I shared as I spent kind of five months cultivating this talk was this that uh, was wisdom from Anita Sanchez that talks about the seventh generation and then in a lot of teachings and, and in a lot of spaces there's this um, there's this allusion to the place that we're in right now of um, the seventh generation and and this being a very pivotal time for change um, and 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 reclamation to 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 where we've come to um, and she says that uh, when the seventh generation of young people come, the great winter will end, for these young people with old spirits will lead and make change. A reuniting with each other and Mother Earth will happen. And um, I weaved this into my talk because in the same tone, um, what I spoke to in my talk was this idea of um, how young people both um, as is being shown here in this space and also with the young people that I have the privilege to work with um, is that we as, as, as the seventh generation um, are doing things differently. Um, you know, I think we have, uh, we don't have time uh, in the same way to, to get caught up in, in some of the more challenging parts of this because we all feel this great sense of, of urgency to, to connect and know that we all have um, gifts and and strengths, no matter who you are and where you come from, to contribute to um, the healing of, of Mother Earth. And, and in that, um, it has to also come the, the healing and connectedness of one another. So my work uh, and the work that I have the privilege to do with young people um, is really supporting um, the resurgence of, of leadership rooted in an Indigenous worldview and walking alongside young people um, in my own journey as well of um, navigating um, who I am and, and, and reclaiming um, a sense of identity and belonging and, and being able to see how in doing that um, we're able to come together and, and understand that um, all these things are, are a pivotal part of, of healing ourselves um, is also a, a pivotal part of, of climate action and being able to uh, work with communities both um, around us and internationally for for the for the place that we live and, and for Mother Earth and that part of that healing is an integral part of that as well. So that's a little bit about me and and what I do and um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to the questions and and would and uh, to conti continue the conversation and and really honored to share space with you um, all of you and um, my hands. My hands go up to you for all the good work that each and every one of you are doing and also acknowledging that it's hard work um, and it feels big and it feels heavy and it feels hard um, and part of part of that is is for, for us to you know re recreate and redesign what it means to be in community so um, yeah I'll hand it back to uh, the, the facilitators and uh, yeah thank you Wow thanks so much for that first round everyone uh, your ability to tie different issues and struggles and movements together is, is really so powerful. I thought maybe for our second round, we'd focus on kicking up that question that Rose brought up of, of how we can coordinate and collaborate across movements and across issues and across countries and cities to really build a powerful mass mobilization. And so we'll go through our circle again in the same order as before, starting with Emily and then Roseanne and Mary Jane Samantha and Caroline, Rose, Danny, and Kiana, uh, just speaking about how we see these opportunities to work together and collaborate and, uh, and build something truly massive. Thank you. I'm just thinking for a second. Um, I think we're seeing, well, part of the question I saw in the email earlier was about um, yeah, collaborating across countries, and I think we've seen acceleration and global movements that have started since the IPCC report <clears throat> came out, so notably Extinction Rebellion and the climate strikes, and also to some extent the Green New Deal, though that's more North America and the UK. And then in Canada, the two sort of national movements 
that are youth-led I can think of are Climate Strike Canada and Our Time, um, which are both really neat. I think young people sometimes, um, especially folks that are like Gen Z teenagers, are very good at coordination and organizing over calls and things like that, and that's really neat to see. Um, I was thinking one thing we could probably do better is organizing more across different countries, like beyond colonial borders and also making more connections with um, climate organizers in the global south. Um, I had a friend um, who was born in India who was like, why aren't you guys focusing on emissions from India and China? And at first I was thinking that's kind of a silly question because we have control over what we do in Canada. But I think he had a point, um, which is that the physics of the problem are completely international. All of our like carbon emissions are going to blend together. And so I think we should be thinking more about how to connect with other movements in other countries. Um, and one thing, one reason I'm excited about the Green New Deal is it's bringing in labor organizers and anti-poverty organizers um, as well, because I think we need to stop thinking about climate change as a environmental issue, per se, um, because it's an issue about of poverty and of labor. And of Great, thanks a lot, Emily. Uh, Roseanne, Mary Jane, would you like to share as well? Um, thank you, that was really, really interesting. Um, yeah, we also have a similar sort of idea of wanting to reach out to organizations who have been doing social and environmental justice for a long time, and particularly the labor movement, um, which is kind of seeing quite a bit of a resurgence in the UK, which is really great. So we, um, we've been reaching out to trade unions in the area, for example, the local renters union, which are really working on like the housing crisis, which is really particularly strong in Brighton at the moment. Um, so we've been reaching out to, we were invited to a trade union conference to discuss the general strike and how trade unions can get involved and how they can get involved in imagining the, um, how workers and students can sort of come together with reimagining what working life can look like. Because I think that's really important to offer a sort of a, a working environment where young people can look forward to working. So I, I think changing the idea of what, what work means and what employment means is super important. And that's why we think labor, uh, the labor movement and um, the student movement, is, it'd, be so, it'd be great to be building those links. And that's what we've been trying to do in the last um, couple of months. Um, we've also been trying to co collaborate across between cities, for example. Um, in the UK, there's quite a north-south divide. So uh, next, uh, next week, we're going up to Liverpool to um, collaborate with some other youth strikers on the climate justice workshop. Um, and sort of like build those, yeah, those links between the much more, the more industrial north and the um, less industrial south. And sort of build those connections between young people in those across cities. But we're also looking to build more connections with um, different countries. Um, that was one of the reasons why I went to Brussels. Was It was a really significant time. It was just the weekend before Brexit, the leaving deal was on the 29th of March. So it was really, it felt very, very significant being in that, being in Brussels that week before and there was so much discussion and to be sh basically showing other young people and MEPs that, that a lot of young people in the UK want to stay within the European Union and keep building those ties between um, those countries. But we're really trying to work on um, outreaching more to more particularly global South countries. Do you want to talk about it a bit more? Yeah, um, I guess we were looking at connecting with also our local organisations. Um, for example, we have a local gallery called Onka who have been doing social and environmental justice issues and raising awareness about them putting on events that we used to go to before we started activism and we'd learned so much um, from them. Um, so we've reached out to them and it's it's really nice to, it's, it's nice to work with people who have experience and um, who can give us expertise, um, give us like help in ways or like talk to us, it is really nice. And we recently held an event with them after a strike um, that we had a couple months ago. Um, it was a letter writing workshop and it was called Letter, Letters to the Earth. And we um, connected with various people we knew um, across the world 
um, and managed to get them to write letters to the earth. So we had one from, there was India, Indonesia, USA, um, various, various different places. And it was really, really powerful mm -hmm. for our reflection of the strike to sit down and read letters um, and, and experiences and kind of just thoughts from people mm -hmm. that we can't connect with literally in like a face-to-face -face, um, way. So that was really powerful to have that after the strike. And I think that's something like creative, like letters and those kind of events are a way, quite, quite an easy way that we can organize mm -hmm. um, kind of, yeah, connecting yeah, and in that sense. Yeah, and also like building empathy as well. I think that's what, what's been coming out quite a lot in this, in this webinar just to create like genuine solidarity between different social movements and not in like a really tokenistic way, but to have like radical and genuine solidarity with other movements. Cool. Thanks so much, you too. Uh, I'll turn it over to Hello. We are already hey. volunteers in our chat box. So if uh, any of our participants out there are wanting to get involved with the movements that you're hearing discussed today, remember that uh, you can connect with people right here in the webinar. We'd also like to invite um, anyone listening online to, to take comments or questions or thoughts you have, particularly around this topic that we're talking about now in terms of organizing across movements, cities, nations, and the day of action that uh, Rose mentioned as well. So take it away, um, Samantha and Carolyn. I think to that question, there's different aspects of it that we work on with Youth versus Apocalypse also. And different things could be like um, what Carolyn does, organizing different youth from different schools, which means people who live in different environments and have a different school life than other youth. And another big part is the intersectionality between different marginalized groups. Like climate change is a universal topic because it affects every community, it affects our entire earth. So bringing together different groups that are also suffering could put a, a big group together that we all care about these issues. Like an example was that we were going to an event and we met people who were trying to advocate for lowering, lowering the rent. And through that we got together with them and we were able to march and chat because we both have issues that we care about and that Everything is a topic that we can bring together people who all want to advocate for what they're thinking, but also want to save all of us. Yeah. So, and um, just to add to that, um, I think what I agree with what Samantha is saying around um, that this isn't just something that, for example, only applies to people who are already thinking about environment, because a lot of times people might be thinking about really pressing needs for safety, for housing, for economic security. And then I, I feel like if we talk about climate in a way where, as I think someone mentioned, getting to the root where all those issues connect in terms of how our economy works by extracting from certain communities and from the earth to make a few people rich, if we like kind of get to that root, we can see how all these issues are connected. And I feel like in terms of collaboration, uh, something that, for example, some youth from Youth First Apocalypse actually led a workshop on power and privilege and organizing with some other um, youth climate justice activists to kind of just talk about the issues that come up and how we're not all coming from the same place and really acknowledging um, privilege and really concretely passing on that privilege, whether that's helping to fundraise so that uh, people can have access to information and logistical support to get places or um, just acknowledging the different issues that come in and in really um, acknowledging the ways that fighting for racial justice, migrant justice, economic justice can connect with the fight for climate justice and how those, all of those injustices stem from the same root. So if we come together, it really strengthens our movement. Um, the other piece I wanted to share related to the day of action that I believe Rose was bringing up is that I think, and some other folks I think have mentioned the September 20th to 27th, it's kind of a whole week of action here in the Bay Area, um, different uh, youth groups as well as different community groups are coming together as well as unions. So it looks like our teachers union is going to endorse um, that day of action on September 20th. And um, we're really thinking about like how can this be a, a moment to bring in so many different um, groups from different backgrounds to do it in a way that acknowledges and lifts up 
those who have been and who are ongoingly pushed out of the dialogue. Um, so I think just really recognizing what it takes for each group to get there um, and kind of like what I think Kiana was saying about um, who we are and where we come from, like just noticing our own roles in the spaces that we're in and how we can uh, make sure that we are actually having a movement that allows everyone and especially those that are most impacted to have a voice in a concrete way. Thanks so much. Rose, would you like to share as well? Yeah, I would. Um, because like I was saying, the, the dates that I had mentioned like around October, October the 4th, there's going to be a gathering at the Peace Arch, which runs along the border between um, the United States and Canada. And particular reasons why we picked there is that that's a provincial park on the Canadian side of the border, but it straddles the um, U.S. side. Because we're on unceded territory of the Salish Nation, the Indigenous people are free to walk back and forth on, on the borders. And so for several months now, we've been working on connecting with the missing and murdered women from Washington State and Portland, Oregon. And we've been having a picnic right there at that crossing because that crossing also symbolizes where there's an intersect between the pipelines, like there's a proposed um, landing at the Cherry Point for the pipeline to come from Canada to the US. So along the way, we've established a report talking about the levels of violence that has escalated in connection of the pipeline and the violence that has been imposed on women and First Nations. That's also a major um, outlet for um, the coal, the coal industry that comes from Canada to the US. There's a, a major freight train that travels through there not very far from that intersection, there's also the fish farm. The fish farm that broke the pens, I guess about a year ago in the San Juan Islands, right across the street from us. So I saw that as a major interception that we could actually shut down the borders and draw the attention of the social impact and the climate change with a captive audience. But we can't do this on our own with just the missing and murdered families. We need our youth, we need labor uh, councils, we need our union people, we need everybody on board for this day of action. But it's an action that doesn't necessarily always have to be at the borders. It could be just shut down all the tills in all the different communities. Just for 15 minutes that would have a rippling effect on the economy. If every woman that is running a coffee shop or a Walmart cashier thrift stores, if we shut down all at the same time, 15 minutes, long enough for a coffee break. Because the women are protecting the one thing that all our governments love, as well as the corporations, and that is money. We can take it to the streets and educate people there's lots of different options that we could do. 
So October the 4th, September the 20th, you know, like, if we all start coming together on conferences like this and start preparing for organizing, we can do it. So it's just something for people to think about is this day of action and considering having Indigenous people from whatever communities you're in, whatever communities you're in, um, to approach the Indigenous people in a culturally good way, as well as our youth. Like I'm thinking about Greta's action right now. Now that's the power of just one youth, one young person starting a global day of action. I think we can all do it. So on that note, I'm going to have to go now because I took an hour off of uh, off of my rest of my work day. So I'm going to say hi to Sam. Thank you very much for your time, and I hope to be chatting with you even more. Thanks so much for joining us, Rose. It's really meaningful to have you with us. Yeah. Danny, would you like to speak next? Sure. sure. I, I'm sort of conscious of the time, and I think a lot of the points that I would have made have already been made in a much more articulate and you know, effective way by the, the people who've spoken before me. But I, I, I think just two things I'd like to say. I'd, and, and sort of coming from the perspective of someone who's you know involved in, in a particular sort of piece of this puzzle, which is the sort of legal constitutional litigation side. And uh, the point I wanted to make is that you know that the legal work we do is is necessarily confined or restrained. And, and what, what I mean by that is there's a lot of sort of academic literature, and it's just sort of a very clear reality that you know courts as an institution you know often serve to restrain and confine and and control activism and, and public opposition to power. And so, you know, and, and what my organization does is try to change that and push the courts. But I, but I think, you know, for that reason, it's, it's crucial in the work we do. And I, I really try to carry this with me that, you know, we do need to build coalitions with, you know, folks outside of, of the sort of legal sector and, you know, and to build dialogues and conversations with frontline groups and with with groups and constituencies outside of the climate movement and to you know listen to them and to incorporate their stories and their lessons and their struggles you know into the work we do as much as possible and and really to try and you know while obviously trying to you know solve this piece of the puzzle and, and win these legal cases at the end of the day to really sort of push the boundaries of the legal system at the same time and, and try and bring those lessons in. Um, yeah I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Thanks so much, Danny. Kiana, will you end our second round for us, please? Yeah. Um, you know, as, as Danny mentioned, there's been some really um, brilliantly articulated um, pieces in here, so I'll keep mine short. But I think one thing that's really important in that um, both in some of the projects that I work in um, and in my own personal research, um, I think part of what's been missing, and it has been alluded to um, here in the conversation around, um, you know, moving climate action and climate justice away from um, solely an environmental issue um, and <clears throat> looking at um, how do we um, create spaces or create movements and, and just generally create space for um, young people and all people to be able to um, see the interconnections between things that um, that they're passionate about, that, that matter to them, um, that matter to their communities um, and to the collectives that they're a part of, um, and, and how is um, climate action a part of uh, that? Um, and I think creating spaces for it to be um, a larger um, conversation um, 
and for us to really understand that moving forward right now um, and in the future that um, climate action it will be a, an inevitable and deeply interconnected part of, of the work that we all do in, in the things that we all care about um, and the places and spaces uh, where we live or, or where we're from or where our family is from, um, that um, this is uh, a, a part of our reality moving forward and, and how do we create space for, um, for that to um, be reflected and, and, to, and to feel as though um, everybody has a role to play and, you know, maybe being <clears throat> being on the front lines of something um, is not is not how everyone can contribute, but that doesn't mean that um, that 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 there isn't a role to play, and that you know not every single person has um, incredible um, gifts and, and innovation and creativity that um, that we need that we need so desperately, and and to kind of open and, and deconstruct um, how the how things have been done previously and continue to do those things and amplify those things and also create more um, spaces for, for people to show up. And then I would say the other thing, um, and it's less of a um, direct thing, but I think in, in this work and in, in the work that I do that focuses on um, the concept of building bridges and, and decolonization and, and reconciliation, um, that um, there's a really important part of doing this hard work um, that we need to remember um, to laugh and to play and to connect and to um, draw strength from those places. I think sometimes um, in this work or when we're gathering or when we're um, planning and organizing um, that, you know, that comes with, with with a heavy level of, of seriousness because the severity is real and the urgency is real. Um, and um, for our, you know, collective well-being, how do we weave in um, celebration and play and success and, and connectedness to one another uh, for the sustainability of, of the movements that we create? So I think that um, a piece for me that I've, that I've really seen and recognized as, as something moving forward um, in, in whatever you know modality or way that it looks like that, that that's a really integral piece for for the collective grief that 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 we're experiencing and, and the sense of urgency that we're also experiencing so I think um, yeah those those are those are some of the points that I think um, the how is less clear and, and I think that's okay I think it can look different um, in in local contexts and in international contexts but I think that piece uh, for me uh, is an integral part of the forefront to keep to keep us um, inspired and connected and, and draw, be able to draw strength in that place. So, yeah. Thanks so much, Kiana. Uh, and thanks to all our speakers for that second round. I, you've all just lit me up. I, I think sometimes this challenge can feel so enormous and so daunting and so anxiety inducing and overwhelming. And hearing all the amazing things that you're doing and the connections that you're drawing and the movements that you're building just fills me with a sense of power and hope and optimism. Uh, I know all our participants are feeling the same way from watching the comment box. I'd also just like to thank our participants for coming and for to remind them of, of one of the themes that came out of this second round, which is that really all issues are climate issues. This affects every struggle, every group, every person, everywhere. So whatever your circles are, if it's your faculty, it's your church, it's your union, it's your book club. Your issue is a climate issue. Reach out to the movements that are happening around you and let's let's take to the streets and make the changes we need to see. Uh, so I'll pass things over to Rebecca just to close us off, but I, I really wanted to extend my own heartfelt personal thanks for the work that you're all doing and for the movement that we can build together. It's so hard that we have to close this now because it feels like the conversation is just starting, but I think that is exactly how we see it here at the Cedar Trees Institute, Center for Global Studies, and ICRD, and you cannot who have been key to organizing this event. We want to keep having these conversations and webinars. There's a lot of comments in the comment box that we haven't had a chance to get to, but we uh, are in touch with everyone who's registered for this webinar, which included a whole lot of people that couldn't make it today, but indicated that they would like to come to future events. And that included the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights and the Environment and a number of academics and practitioners around the globe. 
So uh, we would love to keep supporting these conversations to happen and organizing and coordination to happen as much as possible. Um, again, just want to um, thank all the online participants who joined us. I want to thank Beata Schmidt uh, from the UPNUTS Project at Center for Global Studies, who was key in pulling together this entire webinar and did an amazing job. Um, and I want to thank my co-moderator, Keith, for being here and all the activism and amazing work that, that he does. Um, and a really just a heartfelt thank you to all of you um, that joined us today. I know, I uh, thank you so much for all the incredible work you're doing, which, without which none of this would be possible. And um, thanks so much for giving so generously of your time to be part of this today. We can't wait to keep the conversation going. So. We'll, we'll say goodbye to everyone for now, and uh, thank you so much. And until until the next time.